Okay, here we are under the Bodhi tree in front of the Mahabodhi uh, Chaitya on Magha Puja, the full moon of Magha in Bodh Gaya, India. And this is the place where the Buddha's, the Bodhisattva's journey came to fruition. So to recap, sometime in the far, far distant past, there was a ascetic named Sumedha. And in all the world he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, ascetic. He was well known, renowned throughout India as a very spiritually advanced individual. And one day he came down from the mountains and heard that the Buddha was, there was a Buddha had arisen and he thought to himself, for sure, if I listen to the Buddha's teaching, I will be able to free myself from suffering. And so all the people were uh, clearing a path for the Buddha to walk and he thought, well, this would be a great act of merit. And so he joined them. But then when he saw the Buddha coming, he realized something. He realized that with his great spiritual attainments, that maybe, just maybe, he would be able to himself become a Buddha. Instead of listening to the Buddha's teachings, he could make a vow to himself to one day be just like that Buddha. Dipankara Buddha was the Buddha at the time. And so instead of waiting to listen to the Buddha's teaching, he lay himself down in the mud and made a vow to himself that he should that his body should be a bridge across the uneven muddy landscape and even though he would probably die as a result of being trod on by all these monks that that should be his uh, sacrifice for the purpose of becoming a Buddha himself. Now Dipankara saw him lying in the mud and said said to his, the monks, you see that ascetic lying in the mud, one day he will become a Buddha. <clears throat> and then for four asankaya and 100,000 great kappa, great eons, this ascetic was born and died and born and died and, and spent countless lifetimes cultivating the perfections. The time that it took, you know, thinking about this moment that we're talking about, the moment of the Buddha's enlightenment, that this place is meant to uh, venerate. An asankaya, the word asankaya means uncountable. But the, uh, to get an idea, the question was, well, if it's uncountable, can you give an idea of what it's like? And so the simile is, suppose you had a... Suppose you had a, a pit, one league wide, 16 kilometers wide, 16 kilometers across, 16 kilometers deep, and every 100 angel years, 100 angel years, someone were to drop a grain of rice into the pit. An angel year, time in heaven is supposed to be different from time on earth, so they say that one day in, in the angel worlds is a hundred years on earth. There's a story of a, uh, an angel, two angels, a husband and a wife, the king and the queen maybe. 
And one morning the king woke up, the angel woke up and his wife, he couldn't see his wife and his wife had passed away and been reborn as a human being. But she remembered being an angel and so she spent 60 years or so on earth doing good deeds to try and re be reborn in heaven. And then in the afternoon in the, in the angel world she was born again and her husband said, Oh, where did you go this morning? <laughs> and she, she explained, she explained, oh, she had, she had passed away and she had been, uh, lived her life on earth. They were always asking her, why, uh, why are you doing all these good deeds? Her husband had died on earth, her husband had died and she did all these good deeds. And uh, they asked, why are you doing it? Oh, when I die, I want to be with my husband again. And they thought, wow, he, she's really dedicated, but it was, it was her husband in heaven. So she explained this to, the, to her husband once she'd returned to heaven, when she'd been reborn there again. And he, he, said, to him, he said to himself, wow, the, the life of humans is so short. And he asked if human beings do good deeds and she said, no, mostly they're negligent, mostly they don't. And he couldn't believe with such a short lifetime that they didn't do good deeds. Anyway, the point being that life in heaven is much much longer. So a hundred years as an angel is about three and a half million human years. So every three and a half million years, which is how long humans have been here on earth, I think, something like that, drop a rice, grain of rice into the pit every hundred years. And then eventually the pit would fill up with rice, no? a canyon basically, great chasm. And once it was full, someone suppose someone were to take a grain of rice out every 100 angel years. The pit would become full and empty again before Anasankaya was out. That's how long Anasankaya is. That's not how long, it's longer than that. So four of those, somehow you can count them a long time and then in his last birth he was born Siddhartha in Lumbini and he grew up in Kapilavatu for 29 years after 29 years he left home practiced with two teachers practiced for six years nearby torturing himself before coming to Bodh Gaya under the Bodhi tree and realizing realizing that neither torturing himself nor engaging in sensual pleasures was the way to find enlightenment and so he found the middle way. <coughs> he spent all night under the Bodhi tree in the first watch of the night he remembered his past lives, he remembered he'd been so many things. He'd been a human, he'd been an animal, he'd been a god, he'd been an angel. In the second watch of the night, he started to think about what it means to be reborn. Not just the fact that we're born as many different things, but that there's reasons why we're born as in different ways. So he saw beings arising and passing away according to their karma. Uh, the state of our minds, the habits and the qualities of mind that we cultivate, he could see how that affected people. He would be able to look at people and understand how they're be born as they are, look at animals, look at gods and angels and so on. And in the third watch of the night, he understood cause and effect. So it's, it's basically a progression from that where not just born and die, born and die, he started to see how it's going moment to moment. Avijja pachaya sankhara. People, because of their ignorance, because they don't, they don't see what they're doing. They do sometimes good things, sometimes bad things, and they seem to be uh, floating around aimlessly on an ocean of samsara. 
And then he saw more precisely vinyana pachaya sankara, uh, sankara pachaya vinyana vinyana pachaya nama rupa. How consciousness leads to experience and experience leads to craving and which leads to clinging, which leads to becoming, which leads us to create and to be reborn. And it was based on that, in summary, that he was able to free himself from suffering, free himself from the causes of suffering, and therefore free himself from suffering. And this is the place, this is the place where that, the Buddha said, Jnanang uh, Udapadi, Chakung Udapadi, Jnanang Udapadi, Vijja Udapadi, Panya Udapadi, Aloka Udapadi. Aloka, light. So we talk about enlightenment. If you remember in Kusinara, I said it's the, maybe the most peaceful place on earth. Well, this place is this place is like the brightest place on earth. This is where light came, the light of enlightenment. So we talk about we talk about enlightenment. What did it mean that the Buddha became enlightened? So it's important to understand what isn't enlightenment, I think. Because when we talk about the Buddha's enlightenment, we're not talking about the time that he spent to become enlightened. We're not talking about the six years. We're not even talking about the time all night that he spent under the Bodhi tree. We're actually talking about just a moment. Enlightenment is a momentary flash of realization. And it's what the Buddha called the Four Noble Truths. So what did the Buddha become enlightened to? He became enlightened to the Four Noble, what we call the Four Noble Truths, which are quite familiar to anyone who knows anything about Buddhism. And so what this means is, first of all, two things. We talk about what isn't enlightenment. For many people, there's this idea that helping other people is enlightenment, that it's enlightened to gain the right qualities of mind and do the right thing. You know, there are many types of Buddhism that talk about putting aside one's own freedom from suffering, putting aside one's own attainment as a means of enlightenment. Because when we talk about the Buddha's enlightenment, we see that it's actually limited. There's a limit to it. The Buddha didn't stay around. The Buddha didn't continue on in the world. The Buddha isn't here. What we have left is his teachings. What we have left is uh, the physical presence. And so people, the, looking for something greater than that, there's this idea of staying in the world. And that's not enlightenment. And the other thing that is not enlightenment is the, the path and the practice that we're doing. We have to be able to distinguish that our practice isn't enlightenment. Because there is this, uh, there can be this idea that the gains that we get from mindfulness meditation, that we get from insight, from from seeing clearly, uh, is somehow the the goal of the practice, right? Sometimes the way we phrase and the way we present uh, insight meditation is such that it appears that the 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 peace and the clarity that comes from being mindful, that that's the goal, that it's somehow a gradual thing. 
And so we have to, at least technically, we have to distinguish the two. It's not to say that our practice is dis disconnected from enlightenment, but it's something separate. What we practice when we practice mindfulness is called the, the preliminary path. We're practicing all of the qualities of the Eightfold Noble Path. We're practicing in line with the Four Noble Truths. But all of it could, could disappear. It comes and it goes. If we stop practicing, if we give it up, we might forget it all. And furthermore, it's not powerful enough to uh, categorically or, or completely change the perspective of the mind. They liken it to heating up two pieces of wood when you want to light a fire. The heat is the same. There might even be smoke. But until you have the ignition, you can't say that you've lit the fire. And as soon as you stop, the heat starts to disappear. So these two things are not enlightenment. Referring to the, the, the idea of, of putting aside your own happiness and your own peace for others, why it's not, why you couldn't call it enlightenment and why we have to be, be careful to understand that we can't consider it enlightenment is because of it lacks the power to actually bring about a, a goal, a meaningful goal. There's, it, it rests on the assumption, first of all, that you could ever come to an end of helping. And even if you could come to an end to helping, meaning you could help everyone, really, that's the only way it could be meaningful. The, only other, the, the other assumption is that it actually helps someone to interact with them without being enlightened. You yourself not being free from suffering, that you should free someone from suffering. You yourself not being uh, free from ignorance should help someone become free from ignorance. And it's simply not powerful enough. The reality of it is that your interactions with them are going to be good and bad, are going to uh, be dependent on your own defilements, your own ignorance and so on. And this is why without the sort of thing that the Buddha did, you see the world coming and going better and worse. You see people cultivating good qualities and cultivating evil qualities back and forth. In, in opposition uh, uh, to that, we have instead what the Buddha did as an example. We have his enlightenment that freed him from suffering. It allowed him to teach other people and free them from suffering. And it also allowed him to teach people to carry on his teaching. And so that's what we mean by... Uh, or that's, that's the sort of enlightenment that we can call true enlightenment. So, our understanding of enlightenment when we talk about what the Four Noble Truths means and the realization and the understanding of the Four Noble Truths we're talking about we're talking about the clearest possible experience of reality so it is very much related to our practice you know, we, 
we talk about mindfulness and we, we talk about mindfulness and meditation in very simple terms in terms of when we see when we hear very mundane terms relating to ordinary everyday experience so it's important to understand enlightenment is not disconnected from that it's not something uh, esoteric or remote or mysterious it's simply that when our experience when our observation uh, when our clarity of mind becomes perfect then it has the power to free us from suffering it has the power to give rise to a well a moment of insight and this is talking about the Four Noble Truths so our practice of studying suffering our practice of abandoning the, the origin of suffering our practice of uh, becoming free from suffering as a result our practice of cultivating the path you know, all of these things build and build and build and eventually we see everything is dukkha everything that arises is dukkha it doesn't mean suffering it means we see that these things are not worth clinging to that there is nothing that can satisfy us there is nothing that we can attain or obtain that will bring us hap true happiness we see through craving that it's not worth engaging in, it's not worth giving rise to craving. We see how our craving leads to suffering. And we see the cessation. We have a moment where our minds let go and release from this samsara, this incessant arising of seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and thinking. We have a moment where we're perfectly in line with what we call the Eightfold Noble Path or the path, the, our way, our way of looking at the world is perfect. Right view and, and right thought and so on. There's, there's nothing, there's no imperfections to our perception. And so when we talk about enlightenment, we mean we mean two things. We mean the ability that the Buddha had to present this, to teach this, and the actual realization for of it for himself. So the Buddha's knowledge that this was the truth, that this was the, the truth of enlightenment, this was the meaning of enlightenment or true enlightenment, that's part of the Buddha's enlightenment. The other part was the actual, of course, the, the realization of it. So when the Buddha realized enlightenment, he became free from suffering. But he, al he also understood what it was that he had attained. That's why we talk about the difference between someone who follows the Buddha and someone who, who becomes a Buddha. For all of us, we have followed after the Buddha. We have undertaken to practice according to his teaching. He has uh, set forth the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And we followed according. But we ourselves, just simply because we practice, we have no, as a result, necessarily ability to explain and describe. Our, our simple practice doesn't allow us to um, explain or, or understand clearly what are the Four Noble Truths.
And so that's what we understand as the difference. There's often, I think, confusion about what is the difference between becoming a Buddha and the follower of the Buddha. And so we have to understand the, the experience of freedom from suffering is the same. The Buddha quite clearly explained that there's no difference between his freedom from suffering and our freedom from suffering, his freedom from defilements and our freedom from defilements. But he also had the clarity of mind and the depth of mind to be able to teach, to understand and to be able to pass it on. And that's the difference. No, no, thank you. No, no, no. no, no. No, thank you. <laughs> And so, enlightenment is not a hard thing to understand. It's the culmination of practice. It's something that it's good to understand, it's good to think of, it's good to look at all the people here who are... Uh, to, 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 to experience and to give rise in our minds to this concept of enlightenment that everyone, you know, many people are here wishing for or striving for, making vows to attain. But likewise, it's important in our practice to focus on the cause. We call it the preliminary path. Our practice is just the preliminary path. But what it means is, it's the practice. Enlightenment is never the practice. Enlightenment is never the focus of practice. It's simply the perfection of practice. Like as they say, practice makes perfect, that's a good summary of what we mean. When we talk about the difference between Buddha and his followers, that's the only difference, is that he was able to pass it along, and that for that he took all this time. When we talk about the difference between working towards that goal and not working towards that goal or being content not reaching that goal we're able to make that distinction that someone who is content with simply being mindful without without putting out effort um, until they realize enlightenment but that's not enough that someone who puts aside enlightenment to stay in the world to help others is ignoring the fact that to free someone from suffering you have to be free you have to be able to engage with them in a way that is free from the causes of suffering and most importantly you have to understand that enlightenment is something that comes from within you you can't enlighten someone else you can't share your enlightenment and ultimately you your enlightenment is not going to uh, allow you to help everyone and so we come here we we, we can come and think of Bodh Gaya as um, the ultimate expression of this perfection of our practice. We can take this time to 
to practice mindfulness, to cultivate clarity of mind. We can see it as the ultimate ideal, that all of our practice that we do in our daily life, in our walking meditation, in our sitting meditation, when we're at a meditation center or at home, we put it we put it up as an ideal of perfection that we're working towards that we should understand suffering and not be bothered by it understand the things that cause us suffering and not let them cause us suffering that we should see how our clinging to things, liking them, disliking them, trying to fix them, all of the defilements in our mind are only causing us suffering. That we should release and let go and our minds become free from suffering. That we should cultivate further and further uh, the qualities that allow us to be free from suffering, the wholesome qualities of mindfulness, concentration, effort, right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration, right mindfulness, right, mindfulness, right concentration. So that's enlightenment. Regarding our practice, we have what we call the four stages of enlightenment. So a person who hasn't practiced to the extent that they're able to have this experience of letting go, the, their old habits of mind are, are, are repressed and they can always come back. We can change from meditation, but we can change back if we stop meditating in our next life or future life. But a person who attains this experience, who attains this one moment where their experience of reality is perfect, that person changes their foundation of experience, their foundation of, of existence. They call it Gotrabu, which means changing your lineage, changing your, your, your family, your, your bloodline. You're no longer part of the old family of ordinary individuals. You're a different kind of person. The first type of person we call a Sotapanna. Simply having this experience once means you've entered, Sotapanna means you've entered the stream. The Buddha said, such a person will only be born a maximum of seven more lifetimes. They've given up wrong view because they've seen what is right. They've seen something about reality that has, has no depth. You couldn't say it only goes to here and that's the limit of it. It has no depth limit meaning there is no limit to it in the universe. Everything ceases. When you have this experience of cessation, there is nothing that is left out, nothing that has not ceased or is not subject to cessation. Everything that arises is subject to cessation. You have no doubt, no doubt about this because you've seen it for yourself, and you have no confusion about what is right practice, what is wrong practice. You have no idea that there are external rituals or prayers or wishes or anything that might be uh, a part of the path or a cause or a, um, a precursor to enlightenment because it's very simple. You've practiced seeing clearly and you've come to understand that enlightenment simply means a moment of clear experience where the mind lets go and there's no uh, there's no connection 
no contact with seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or feeling or even cognizing, no mental or physical arising, no memory of it. It's beyond memory, you don't even remember it happening. But you know it happened. After the fact, you know it happened. But you don't know what it was because there was no memory. No perception, no apperception. That's Sotapanna. Sakadagami, the second stage of enlightenment. Such a person will only be born a maximum of one more time. And this is because they've experienced this cessation uh, repeatedly to the point where they have reduced any further amount of clinging, not, not eradicated it, but they've reduced it so much that you could say of such a person they only have one more lifetime. The third stage of enlightenment, anagami, they have, they have actually done away with aversion and, and sensual desire. So they continue on and continue on and, and by repeated experience and further clarity and further uh, experience of, of cessation, they come to see that there's no more anger in them, that there's no more craving for sensuality, for beautiful sights or sounds that they've eradicated it. And the fourth stage of enlightenment we call Arahant. Arahant simply means one who is worthy, but an Arahant is... So sorry, an Anagami... Anagami means they won't come back. But they will be reborn in the Brahma realms. An Anagami will still be reborn in, in the higher Brahma realms. But never again as a human or a Deva, an angel. But an arahant, an arahant, when they pass away, the, like in Kusinara, there is no returning, there is no coming back, there is no further arising of mental or physical experience. And such a person, they've, what they've done away with is ignorance. They've done away with conceit, they've done away with any kind of mental uh, clutter or, or chatter. They've done away with any desire for even um, intellectual or spiritual pursuits. And they've attained the same freedom from suffering as the Buddha. They still live, they continue their lives, they still teach, they still help. We can see that this is how, this is the reality, you know, this is what works. Without the Buddha's enlightenment, there would be no arahants. Without the arahants, there would be no practice of mindfulness to this day. There wouldn't even be people thinking of putting aside enlightenment if there hadn't been a Buddha who had gained enlightenment. There certainly wouldn't be this ca catchphrase of mindfulness that we hear about in the West and all throughout the world of people practicing but being content with ordinary practice. So this is the power and the greatness of enlightenment. This is perhaps the most important aspect of the Buddhist teaching, the most important place in our journey, the most important part of Buddhism is the enlightenment. Buddha means one who is enlightened or one who is awakened. And it, it, it's an apt name because that is the focus in Buddhism, not on worship or, or ritual or uh, moral precepts or anything. The focus is on wisdom, understanding and, and enlightenment. So that's where we are today. The brightest, perhaps the brightest spot in the world. And this is our last day of the, the pilgrimage. So thank you all for listening and for keeping up with the teachings.
wish you all freedom from suffering and enlightenment. Thank you.